So I was born in Jamaica. I remember as a child sitting, listening to my father as he talked about important things with his doctor friends. They talked about how, as we gained independence from the British, the islands of the Caribbean would need to think about how to ensure the health of their people. To them, they thought that health was a human right, but not one that they could take for granted. It was something they were going to have to fight to protect. For them, health meant being able to provide good food for children, or being able to ensure that women could give birth safely, or being able to protect babies from infection. As I listened in, I remember thinking, these are really, really basic things. Surely these are things that everyone should have. And that is why many years later, I now work on vaccines. I work on them because they protect you from disease and they keep you healthy. They act like an invisible cloak, working 24-7 to protect you from unknown and unseen threats. But working on vaccines has not always been a particularly revered profession, at least not until 2020, when all that changed and suddenly it became the most important and urgent job on the planet. As the pandemic unfolded, it became increasingly clear that the key to restoring global order would be access to these simple interventions that I had dedicated myself to. But there is the problem. There simply aren't enough vaccines to go around. And over the year, I went from being vaccine researcher to fighting for people's access to them. So what actually happened over the last 18 months? In 2020, the SARS-CoV-2 virus was the common foe, I think, for all of us on the planet. All around the world, we retreated into our homes and we took shelter from this invisible enemy. We tracked its spread as if we were watching a movie like the Andromeda strain. Around the globe, we waited for our, our governments, our leaders, our scientists to find some sort of solution. And meanwhile, the COVID-19 pandemic ripped away from so many of us our health security, that fundamental human right I care so much about. It exposed the vulnerability of both individuals and entire nations rendered helpless, unable to protect themselves or their people. But did you also notice how it was strangely unifying? It was revealed our shared humanity, our common frailty, our dependence on each other to keep ourselves and our communities safe. It got to the very core of the human condition. It was briefly a time when we could reach across divides, be they religious, political, from global north to global south, to extend a hand in unity. The COVID-19 pandemic could have been a definitively unifying point in history. But all that changed on November 9th, 2020. Do you remember what happened that day? This is what happened that day. It was a pretty important day. Nearly a year ago to the day, a small German biotech company called BioNTech working with a multinational drug company called Pfizer, announced the efficacy of their messenger RNA vaccine against COVID-19. 11 months into the pandemic, a new and innovative technology had been used to make a vaccine in record time, a vaccine that was not only safe, but highly efficacious. November 9th, 2020 is a day that should go down in history as one of mankind's most glorious moments, a triumph of science and innovation, a day when scientists showed their ingenuity and their progress to combat disease. Since then, since the invention of mRNA vaccines, they have been an amazing success. They have saved millions of lives. They have kept many people out of hospital. Can you imagine dealing with the alphabet soup of variants without a vaccine? Can you imagine not being vaccinated during these roller coaster rides of Alpha and Delta? So far, we have been really lucky and we haven't needed a new vaccine. 
But if we do need one, I'm sure you all agree it's reassuring we could make one with mRNA. But before you get too carried away with that version of events for 2021, let me show you some data. This graph shows you the share of the population fully vaccinated against COVID-19. In green, the United States, in India, in blue, my homeland, Jamaica, in red, and Kenya, in brown. As of last month, about 60% of the US population were fully vaccinated. But compare that to Kenya, where it's less than 2%. This is the reality of vaccine inequity. So how did we get here? How, let's look at the timelines for rollout of vaccine in these different countries. As many of you recall, vaccinations began in the US in December and then rapidly increased over time. In India, vaccinations didn't begin until March, and then they slowly increased. In Kenya and Jamaica, vaccinations didn't begin until May. In Kenya and Jamaica, they cannot manufacture vaccines. And that delay was a major loss of life. And in the case of India, allowed the emergence of the deadly Delta variant. So what I have shown you is that unlike that global unity of 2020, 2021 it essentially became two pandemics. On one hand, um, access to vaccines became the ultimate definition of the have and the have not. For those of us in America, anyone who wants a vaccine can get one. In contrast, in Africa, people are having to fight for access to vaccines. And in the absence of a vaccine solution, all they can do is hope that a more deadly variant doesn't emerge. So that amazing result of November last year was in fact a fork in the road. On one hand, it was a scientific triumph that has saved millions of lives, and on the other, it was the beginning of vaccine inequity. It heralded a crack in our global unity, a crack that has widened with time to form a chasm between people, a chasm of unprecedented proportion. Vaccine nationalism by high-income countries has become an existential threat to the poor. In my opinion, when we look back at this point in history, we may see this as one of mankind's greatest moral failings. So how can we heal this fractured world? In future pandemics, we cannot ask poor nations to rely on the goodwill of rich countries, not after they have seen how empty the promises of equitable access are and how quickly they morphed into vaccine nationalism. To heal this divide and to ensure that this inequity never happens again, more countries must be able to manufacture vaccines for themselves. Let's just take Africa as an example. Africa is a continent of 1.2 billion people. But only 1% of vaccines for Africa are made in Africa. So why is that? Because Africa is woefully underserved by vaccine manufacturing, and they are almost entirely dependent on other countries to make and supply these essential medicines. So how are we going to fix that? How is the world going to build enough vaccine factories to serve everyone? Well, fortunately, there is a new technology that might help make this possible. So what is that, you may say? It's the same innovation that happened last year. It's mRNA. So what many of you, or most of you, don't know is that mRNA vaccines are actually manufactured using a totally disruptive approach. Unlike ordinary vaccines, where every vaccine requires a special boutique facility and every facility can cost hundreds of millions of dollars to build, mRNA vaccine factories can all be built the same. And to make a vaccine against a different disease, you can use the same factory and all you do is to plug in a different genetic code. And this is what makes them cheap and easy to build. And this is what will help democratize access to them. 
And can more countries around the world access them regionally? Well, yes, this is another aspect of their disruptive potential. mRNA factories can be built like those prefab houses where every house is identical and able to serve your every need. And like them, they can be built in one place and then shipped all over the world. Because they are essentially clones of each other, they can be coordinated and work in a network. They can be daisy-chained together to provide vaccines for all of humanity in times of crisis. I think this is the game-changer that poor countries need to bridge the gap. This is the leapfrog technology that will allow us to access vaccines in future pandemics. So is there a way we can get more vaccine factories to people around the world? Yes, and this is exactly what the mRNA companies are beginning to think about. The same pioneers that invented the mRNA vaccines in the first place are thinking about how to deploy their technology. So how can we all come together to help with this bold effort? So firstly, people will need to be trained to do the work. Manufacturing vaccines is really, really complicated, and we must ensure the safety and the quality of every single dose produced. And we will need to teach people in different regions how to do that. Secondly, there are infrastructure problems that poor countries will need to address. They will need to build facilities. Their governments will need to provide water and power and ensure that they are kept to standard. They will need to think about sustainability. This is what organizations such as PAHO, the Pan American Health Organization, and PAVM, the Partnership for African Vaccine Manufacturing, are doing. They are working regionally to make this happen. And lastly, the entire world needs to come together to finance this. No individual, no single foundation can do this alone. It will take rich countries to provide long-term financial support. And it will take people like you to ask your governments to help. But you may say, why should we help? It's not our problem. But you see, it is your problem. It's everyone's problem. Think of it like this, like a global insurance policy but a policy to protect not just poor countries, but all of humanity against the next pandemic. And because all of us will benefit, all of us should pay. For health security, access to vaccines is like access to the internet for the digital revolution. Can you imagine not being able to log on during an emergency? This is the same. Can you imagine being in the middle of a pandemic and not being able to access a vaccine? In the next pandemic, let's make sure that everyone can access the RNA network. I can assure you that pandemics will happen in the future. But the divisive nature of our response to this one was a self-inflicted wound that should never be allowed to happen again. Let's, <laughs> let's hope we can take advantage of the um, ability of mRNA to help end this pandemic and to build a network to prevent this from ever happening again. Thank you.